like to say, uh, Daniel came from Mid Coast after I think 17 years. Uh, Daniel with uh, Barry Antos, who's the executive director of Billy T. And um, Stephanie, one of the counselors at Billy T, came from Mid Coast, and and she uh, she's actually the longest tenured um, employee of Billy T. Catan. She's got something like, <clears throat> excuse me, 10 or 12 years, and um, so Mid Coast has been around for a while. They do good work. They <clears throat> recently moved their offices from uh, downtown to um, Navarro Street, and they have a thrift store across the uh, street from their offices and uh, people donate goods and, and things and then they <clears throat> put them back out for resale. So we like to uh, pay homage to uh, Mid Coast and um, glad to have uh, glad to have them as part of the ROSC. And without further ado, Wendy Duvall is the director of Mid Coast Family Services Women's Crisis Center. Wendy was born in Southern California, moved to Victoria and 94 and raised her children. She began working for the city of Victoria in 2002 until cancer diagnosis in, in 06. And she began to shift more toward advocacy and education, primarily in breast cancer awareness through a strange turn of events, which I'm waiting to, breathlessly to hear about. <laughs> uh, this led to her becoming the crime victim liaison for the Victoria Police Department, where she remained until her retirement in 2022, when he is now the director of the Women's Crisis Center in Victoria, where she expects gentle self-reflection and kindness from her staff and compassionate healing for the clients they serve. So, Wendy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Just a plug for our thrift store. Um, first, let me say, I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me, Charlie. Mm -hmm. uh, plug for our thrift store. We have two thrift stores, one on uh, Sam Houston, one on Navarro. And both of them, their purpose is to fill in the gaps where our grants and um, things like that don't cover. And so everything that gets donated to the thrift stores those funds are, uh, they go directly back into shelter. They help keep our lights on. They keep our, um, you know, our pantries full and uh, they help us pay for the things that otherwise we would really be struggling for. So, you know, when you're cleaning out your closet, if you're looking for a place to donate to, definitely donate to um, the thrift stores, uh, Mid Coast Family Services because it, gen it genuinely does help us a lot. Like I said, I, uh, like Charlie said, I am Wendy Duval, and um, uh, I work for Mid Coast Family Services. We serve seven counties, uh, which is Victoria, Calhoun, DeWitt, Jackson, Goliad, Gonzalez, and Lavaca. Um, I still have to read that because I am only a year old with Mid Coast. Um, and the funny turn, a strange turn of events that took me from, I was, when I started with the city of Victoria, I worked for nine years at the uh, city secretary's office doing birth and death certificates. And uh, that's where I had the cancer diagnosis. And at, once I was through with chemotherapy, and I, I needed war buddies to talk to about what I'd been through. And we didn't really have a uh, breast cancer support group that was for the working gal, we had a long running support group that was during the day and it just didn't fit with my schedule. So I said, screw it, I'm gonna start my own. So I did and I ran that for about eight years. And um, through that, you know, I, I truly believe that um, we are all born with certain gifts. And one of my gifts is when people are in severe trauma in crisis, I get super calm. I get real mellow. And I don't, I don't, I won't pat their hand and say, oh, it's going to be okay. Because, you know, a lot of the time that's not okay. And um, so yeah. during that time, uh, there, in, in 2000, I was uh, diagnosed in 2006, started the su support group in 2007. Uh, in 2010, uh, a woman that I knew for many, many years was the victim of a murder-suicide. Her name was Christy Chavez, and she was um, 
separated from her husband um, and had gotten an apartment and they'd been separated for a year and she had started dating someone. He found out about it and he broke into her apartment and killed her with a shotgun and then turned the shotgun on himself. And I had no idea that there was problems in their relationship. I felt so, such a lack of control or even knowledge about what was really going on there in my community. And, but I, I got to witness the uh, crime victim liaison really help this family in setting up the funeral, getting everything paid for, really providing some important critical services for the family. And um, I was just uh, really blown away with that. So I, not long after that, the crime victim liaison vacated her position and I applied for it pretty swiftly. And uh, the chief knew me and I interviewed me, offered me the job and I took it and I remained there for the remaining 12 years of my career at the city of Victoria. And that's where my eyes were really open to the amount of stuff that goes on in the city. We are a smaller city, small, you know, uh, population size, but we have big city crime. And so my role there was working with victims of violent crime. That could be anything from domestic violence, robbery, murder, um, you know, you name it. Um, sexual assault, I accompanied sexual assault victims to their SANE exams, um, whether they were children or adults. Um, worked very, very closely with the assault team detectives. And um, in 2022, uh, next year will be a year or next month will be a year, I um, learned of the opening of the director of uh, residential services at the Women's Crisis Center. And uh, March is also when I hit my 20 years at the city. So it was like, okay, God, I see what you're doing there. You're opening a door for me. I better walk through. So um, that's what I did and uh, hit the ground running. Um, I I knew I was going to be working with a lot of the same clients, um, but just kind of in a different, um, different, slightly different field or a slightly different um, vein, because at the police department, there was a lot of death. And once there's no pulse, you can't really, there's not much you can do to help. But at the shelter, there's still a heartbeat, there's still hope. So uh, I, that's what the mindset I went in with. And I observed for about two months before I made any changes. Um, but if you ask most people who have been in shelters, they will tell you they women's shelters feel like um, women's prisons because there's are so many rules. And some of them, some of the rules are based in necessity. You know, because you've got to have security. You've got to have everything locked down um, just for their safety and for our safety. Uh, our location, if you ask me where the shelter is, I can't tell you because we're a secure location. And um, we, the, when I walked in, there were, there were women leaving because saying there's too many rules around here. Um, we have, we're one of the few shelters in Texas that have kennels because we don't want someone's fur baby to be their barrier to finding safety. And we were, these, if they're, if they're fleeing and they love this animal enough to take these animals with them, we were locking down the kennels where they couldn't get in the kennels to visit their animals. If they were having a panic attack in the middle of the night or anything, we were locking down the kennels at 8, 8 p.m. And you know, it didn't take me long to realize that's unacceptable. We need to be able to keep those kennels open. So if they need to go out there, worst case scenario, have a pallet and sleep in that kennel with their dog, they need to have the availability to do that. The dogs can't be inside the shelter because we have a, um, we have a person-centered, yes, absolutely, uh, and trauma-informed. Uh, we have a working kitchen, a full commercial kitchen, 
And so, you know, we don't want to get on the wrong side of health department. So we have to follow certain rules. And uh, so that was one of the changes that I made was opening the kennels. We had strict write-ups. If you got written up three times, you were exited. And I thought, these are grown women here. They have been under the thumb of their abuser for however long they've been together with this abuser, not, not counting the abusers they've been in before. And we are re-victimizing them by giving, telling them that they have to follow the rules. They have to do chores to be allowed to stay here. They have to, you know, just do all of these things, which is so abuser uh, mimicking, in my opinion. So I got rid of the write-ups. I got rid of the strict curfews um, because these are grown women. Uh, we had, I noticed a situation where we had power and control where it involved food and the, uh, some of the staff we had at the time, uh, were really fat shaming some people and being very controlling with food. We tried some staff development that didn't work. So we did have to, um, make some changes, get some new people. You sometimes can't grow a great garden unless you pull some weeds. So we did have to pull a few weeds. Um, we found, I was hearing feedback from our clients that it was humiliating for them having to ask for uh, hygiene products because we were using the little hotel size because that's what we were donated. And, but it was humiliating for them to come and ask for shampoo and uh, the little baby shampoos and, and soaps every two days. And then some of our staff would be like, why? I just gave some to you. What'd you do with it? We can't have that. So it was my goal that we switch to uh, full size everything, and that we switch. We also include um, products that are uh, for different ethnicities, different hair types. Uh, I want the woman of color to be able to walk into our hygiene closet uh, and see products that she recognizes because if she doesn't if she only sees products that are for my hair that gives that sends her a message that she doesn't belong so that was one of my goals that turned out to be a little problematic because um money funds those things are expensive the hotel size were donated those were free we didn't have anything out of pocket so i came up with a great idea i thought it was a great idea uh, for Domestic Violence Awareness Month, we I set up a an Amazon wish list. We called it our shelter shower. And for Domestic Violence Awareness Month, we had this shelter shower. I loaded it up with all of our wish list stuff, and and we kind of did a, a mediocre blast on social media about we've done all the hard work for you. All you have to do is sit in your recliner and hit buy, and it automatically ships right to our offices. And that worked pretty well. And um, I actually, thank you. I actually- You're welcome. Cause I was I, like, oh, I'm going to put it in there. <laughs> I will actually share my screen right now. Oh, uh, it's disabled. Um, I wonder if I can put it in the chat. I created a- Charlie, um, can you, Charlie, can you enable her to share her screen? I created a QR code this morning. And oh, cool. Yeah. So if I can share my screen, I'll I will try to get a hold of Charlie. There, he did it. There's okay. Awesome. Episode. Thanks. And uh, if you guys want to screenshot it, and uh, I think we'll probably be using this more on social media blasts because once uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month was through, I didn't want to quit with because we were having such great result. We were having, you know, uh, a lot of uh, shampoo and conditioner sets for African-American children. Uh, and with that type of hair, I'm gonna go ahead and reduce this now and stop sharing if everybody's okay. I'll put it up again at the end. Um, we got a whole bunch. We've got like 30 sets, 30 bottles of shampoo and conditioner for, for children of color. And um, that was so wonderful. I didn't want to stop because we were finding so much success. So I changed the name from the shelter shower to the shelter wish list, and it's not going away. 
and we're continuing to add stuff to it as we need. Basic stuff, toilet paper. There's we got we're a 38 bed facility. We got a lot of butts in that facility. So, you know, we've got um, uh, paper towel. You know, the the trifold paper towels that are dispensable. Um, toilet paper, shampoo, conditioner, deodorant, um, trash bags. We go through so many trash bags. So, I mean, there are things on there that you wouldn't think. Um, combs, brushes, uh, picks, hair picks, toothbrushes, toothpaste, all of that stuff. Because you've got to think of uh, the woman who leaves a sexual assault exam has nothing but a hospital gown she's wearing. And she comes to shelter. She needs emergency clothing so she can flop into bed and she can get some rest. And the next morning she can get up, she can get a voucher to our thrift store and go and get some clothing that she needs. Um, but she's not going to get underwear at the thrift store. So, you know, we need underwear. We need socks. We need um, supplies of shoes and uh, stuff like that. So there's a lot of stuff on our shelter shower that we are really proud of. Um, one of the things that I noticed pretty early in my career at the police department was, number one, how much substance abuse goes into family violence, domestic violence, and um, how much even social media. You know, it used to be police reports would start with um, reporting party said she and offender, and I'm using she and he just because that's, even though the abuse is normal on both sides, it's just poorly reported on the male victim side, but that's another talk. But uh, used to start, you know, reporting party said she and offender were drinking and he got upset over something she said, and then the fight was on. And these days, the, probably in the last 10 years or so, it started out, uh, reporting party said he snatched up her phone, saw she was talking to somebody else and got mad and the fight was on. But substance abuse disorder will always go hand in hand with domestic violence, not only because Addicts tend to be attracted to other addicts because um, I, if I'm an alcoholic, I want to be with somebody who drinks like I do. And also, if you are in a victim environment where you are a victim in a, um, a intimate partner violent relationship, you do what you need to do to cope. And sometimes that is escape through substance. So it was my goal from the very beginning, my first day at the shelter that I wanted to bring AA meetings into the shelter. And so I wanted a group of women who were, um, who were, had longtime sobriety, who would be willing to start a rotation of coming into the shelter and holding meetings. So far, we've had about six or seven applications filled out. A couple of women have gone through the training and it is on my immediate future to-do list to get that first meeting started. Um, I want to hopefully have that done before my the date of my first anniversary at the shelter. That is a goal for me. Um, so I am, you know, it's all hand in hand. Um, when I did the, when I focused on compassionate healing and wanting that to be the focus of how our shelter felt, I wanted to, I knew that that was the only way, the way we were going to get survivors to stay in shelter and not immediately drop charges and go back to their abuser. Because going back to their abuser, they know the rules at that place. They already know the rules. They don't have to, you know, if they stayed at the shelter with the previous um, rules and, and regulations. It was always they were getting called on the carpet. You're doing this wrong. This is against the rules. You're going to get a write up. I wanted, if somebody missed, if somebody misstepped, or they did something that maybe was problematic. You know what? Rather than writing them up, that is a great opportunity for us to open a dialogue with them, and say, okay, this is what we noticed. Um, tell us how you felt when this happened and let us tell you why that maybe it's not a good idea to repeat it and you're not in trouble. Let's, you know, 
get them to kind of understand how it was an issue. And nine times out of 10, they never repeated that same thing again because they got it. And they appreciated the compassion. They can pre appreciated the, the loving environment that the shelter has become. Um, and it kind of brought a halt to that cycle of violence. Um, we have a great uh, success rate with rehousing our uh, family violence, our survivors. And uh, that's with the help of these, not only the Section 8 um, voucher program, but also our rapid rehousing and uh, programs through our homeless division. And so it has been such a beautiful thing to see these survivors get into their own place and feel so proud of themselves. And they still come back and they participate in group. They still come back and they have sessions with their counselors and uh, they keep in contact with us and let us know how successful they are. Sometimes do they wind up back in the same situation and back in our shelter? Sometimes, yes, that happens because of the cycle of violence. And sometimes these wounds are deep in these survivors. And it, it takes more than a 60 day stay and the keys to a new apartment to um, build new pathways in the brain. So, you know, I, my, my motto over the last year has been, we are the seed planters. All we can do is plant the seeds. God is the waterer. So. Uh, that is about my 20 minutes. If I would love to open the floor to questions or comments. Hey, Wendy, I got a quick question. Uh, this is Isaac from uh, TBC, the Texas Behavioral Care Program. I'm one of the psychologists there. Uh, I really love um, part of being a healer for trauma uh, is bringing a open, compassionate, creating that environment of safety. So I really appreciate uh, the changes that you made. I'm wondering of the, cause it's a mindset, right? It's almost a, a culture that you have to change. Was there any uh, kind of drag against it, challenge in creating a different culture? I know you mentioned there was uh, former employees, but I'm curious your other experiences. Pushback, absolutely. Not from my supervising team. They were very, um, do what you want. Uh, this sounds wonderful, keep going. But it was this, the boots on the ground that I got pushed back from because they have been, they have lived this way. They haven't known anything else. And it took probably six months of really driving it home. This is why. And seeing them seeing how it created a different environment in our shelter. And it took some redirection on multiple different times, but you know, even so, even uh, staff who have been there 20 plus years, uh, they said, we didn't realize how we were re-traumatizing. Thank you for, you know, it's a much happier environment from the staff point of view and also from the client point of view. There's a question in the chat that um, Simi sent, Simi Patel, she uh, asked, how do you handle conflicts in the shelter? I've been uh, to so many where there have always been lots of internal conflicts. So Simi does a lot of oral dental hygiene or oral dental care, provides dental care to um, people from shelters. We don't, I mean, we, we do very rarely have like knock down threat, you know, thrashing fights, client on client. Um, we have had a couple of situations where it's kind of edged that way, but my staff is really great at um, going in and intervening and saying, okay, let's separate. We're gonna talk about this. If one, of, if one or both are in crisis, we will call a counselor in to kind of de-escalate. And if it just gets, you know, hairy, then I have to, there have been a couple of cases where I've had to exit someone who just, you know, threatens, threatened a child, 
or actually, you know, we haven't had anybody really lay hands on anybody, but the threat was um, a couple of situations deep where I had to say, you know what, you got to go. So, and I'm, that's unfortunate, but sometimes you, for the success of the whole, you have to say, this isn't the right fit for you. Wendy, this is Sharon Dormeyer from the School of Nursing at A&M, <clears throat> excuse me, and that was a great presentation and really similar to Isaac, I was really impressed with the changes you're making and, you know, the theory-based approach, and I can, I can understand how the staff would be, you know, we've been restrictive and these are the reasons why, and then they see the difference that that would take time for them to buy into. I was thinking this uh, spoken like a true researcher, right? This needs to be published. You need to get that out there so that other people can change the way they do it and not re-inflict re the trauma. That is a great idea. Actually, this is, I can't take credit for all of this. I was lucky enough to go to the Crimes Against Women conference in May of last year. I'd been on the job two months and we were able to create a think tank of about eight women who are directors of shelters all over the state. And we were, we spent four hours together hashing stuff out. How do you handle this? Mm -hmm. That's where the light bulb really came on for me. Mm -hmm. um, and really the, the ringleader of that was the director of the Genesis program in uh, Dallas. And, but I, I think that is a great idea to have it published. That's really overwhelming to me. So I would love help in doing that. But I think, you know, I think the, um, the trend overall in shelters is rule reduction, but it's a hard sell for mm -hmm. people who have, had, who have been brainwashed to think that rules are necessary for mm -hmm. the safety of their shelter, because it's really not. As long as you're communicating and you're coming from a, um, awesome, uh, coming from a, place of trauma, being a trauma informed and really operating from a place of love and compassion and healing. Um, mm -hmm. If you're, you're missing one of those components, you're going to get off the beam. You're going to get off the, mm -hmm. and you're just going to continue re-traumatizing. So there, are, you know, I'm not saying I don't have bad days and I don't miss the mark sometimes because absolutely I do, but my staff is loving enough that sometimes they have to say, uh, Let's talk about this. And we we have staffing um, that we have together with our um, some of our advocates, like our child advocate and our case manager and Miss Molly, who's our longtime uh, hotline um, advocate, and our our counselor side, our non-res side. And we come together every two weeks and we go, Client by client by client by client by client. What does this one need? What are their issues? How can we accommodate? How can we make their stay better? How can we offer what they're missing? What programs are out in the community that we can pipeline in? And that's the only way we can do it is we have to all be a team. Thank you. Wendy, I need to get you hooked up with our Center of Excellence for Forensic Nursing that we have over in our School of Nursing, because um, they always talk about the Crimes Against Women Conference, and I, I think, isn't it coming up, or is it? It's usually in April. Mm -hmm. uh, April, okay. Yeah. Then they have the Crimes Against Children in October. Right. Okay. Wonderful conference. I will never again go in my lifetime. It was mess me up for months. <laughs> oh. Nothing but a week of, of crimes against children is just too much for me. Yeah. yeah. Wendy, I had a, a question. Uh, do you, uh, I know you said that you wanted to get a first AA meeting set up, but do you all have uh, counselors that you work uh, with or that you bring in or that they see specifically? Yes. At next door at our center, our yeah. non res place, that's where we have our, they, um, we have I think five counselors over there that okay. do group every day of the week and then they do one-on-one -on -one counseling. Is it is that mandatory? 
it's not technically mandatory, but it's highly encouraged. And if they, if somebody gets to the end of their 60 days and they want to add it, ask for an extension of 30 days, you know, their apartment isn't ready, they're not ready to leave, they're doing some really great work, then it becomes mandatory. If you want an extension, you have to be in counseling, you have to be going to group, and you have to be, you know, you can't just be using the shelter as a flop house because, you know, we can get into that scenario as well. Hi, Wendy. Uh, do you see, this is Cindy Patel again. Um, how, do you see um, quite a few people, uh, victims of human trafficking? In um, yeah, not as many as I think, I think we have a large number that don't outcry. There have been a couple that I've kind of recognized just from my experience at PD working with human trafficking where I have kind of gently asked, is this what's happening? And um, then we, you know, we kind of back up and, and handle that kind of situation a little bit differently. We really kind of go more, um, okay, really tightly side by side with a counselor. This has been a fantastic meeting. Thank you so much for your questions. Let me pop up that QR code one more time. Oh yes, please do. And feel free to share it. Um, feel free to uh, purchase items for us. <laughs> and uh, next time you clean out your closet this spring, um, make sure and donate to one of our thrift stores. I could see this also. Um, <clears throat> our nursing students like to do projects and collect things, and I could see this being something we could connect our a couple of student organizations to, like our um, women's health focused group and the students in general. And they they do a pretty good job of collecting things. Awesome! One of our oh, yeah. fourth grade, one of our fourth grade uh, Catholic classrooms chose Midcoast as their um, Catholic Schools Week um, oh, kind of collecting fundraiser. And I just picked up that donation last week. And it was oh, that's a neat. bunch of fourth graders had some really great questions that I had to kind of dial oh. down to their age group for the answers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a Thank tough you. room to navigate in general with fourth graders. <laughs> they, were, they were really well behaved. And two of the boys, we carry the donations to my car and I was so impressed. Oh, wow. There you go. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yes. For thank you very much. And Wendy, I'm going to be in touch because we do have a, a safe mothers project that we're working on um, through some, some different researchers and you've been on my list. So I will get in contact in the next month or so. I'm going to pop my um, email address and phone number. I'll put the um, 573, you know, I'm gonna put my desk number here. There's my contact info, or you can call the hotline because that rings directly to the shelter and uh, Miss Molly will get that call to me, or you can just yeah. send an email. Well, thank you all. I'm going to pop off so I can get to my next next two, but um, you're appreciated. It's nice to see everyone's face. Charlie, thank you as always for hosting. Thank you very much. I'm going to hop off too. Have a great day, everyone.